I'd like to thank you, Christophe, for inviting me to participate in this conference on text and image relations in Buddhism. Uh, again, as you've noted, and I hope people really don't know me that well, uh, I have been working on the Buddhist site at Baoding Shan um, since 1992. So um, a long time, roughly 25 years, if you take it to my final work, which was the, the book publication. Um, and I, I think the trajectory of this work might be helpful for those of you who are newer to looking at um, text and image relationships and newer to thinking about how they function within a, um, a Buddhist site or a, a, a sacred site. Um, and so what I'm going to do here in the next half hour, and I'll keep it pretty straightforward, is I'm going to sort of outline uh, how I approach things and kind of use this as a case study for you all to think about um, how you go from creation through consumption and onto reception in terms of um, a singular site. And along the way, if something comes up, uh, feel free, you know, in the moment to pop that question into the chat and I'll be happy to um, dig in with those later on. So we'll start with creation. So as someone like myself, who's trained originally in Buddhist sculpture with somewhat more traditional methods of analysis, I always begin um, basically with the visual. Um, so what can you know about a site simply by looking at what is there? Um, and so taking that a step further, as you work with sacred sites more holistically, it's important to bear in mind the evolutionary quality of a site and the texts and images they contain. And with a sacred site like Baoding Shan, and this has sort of already been mentioned, you have to remember that the site is conceived in one way, but it comes down to us in a very different way from its inception. So uh, for those of you who haven't been to Baoding Shan, I'll, I'll take you on a little virtual tour here. So what is there and what do we really know about Baoding Shan? So again, taking a really broad view, it's important to look first at location and materials. Um, both of these are going to help answer some of the questions that'll play out related to text and image that come up later on. Um, location is really important as it will in many ways drive who uses a site and why a site is built in the first place. So when you're talking about Baoding Shan, basically it's perched up on a hill above a meander that is going to develop into this nice rocky Oxbow. Um, and access to Baoding Shan in the 12th century most likely was both by land and water. So here's the plan of Great Buddha Ben, Dafo Wan, showing staircases leading down to a river. Um, and here you have the view of the river below and an undated photo showing on the left showing um, the access coming up from below, you may notice the people sort of peering over the cliff. I can probably use my cursor here, here, <laughs> where you now have a modern entryway. Uh, I argue that the monastic community is going to be coming in from above, from the top, right? So you have these two different ways of uh, thinking about access to the site and that access to the site affecting um, basically how people are going to engage with the site. And again, the lay public are going to be coming up from the, the river. And when they enter the site, they basically uh, encounter the name of the site and then the wheel of transmigration. So in addition to location, you also have to think about materials. And I'll just briefly touch on this because materials are really important as they remind us about possible changes that take place at sites, right? So such changes may or may not affect a site's usage over time. Um, the temple and the pagoda at Baoding Shan date to a Qing dynasty restoration, um, which was also the case with the wooden covering of the thousand armed Guan Yin figure um, that was put in in uh, 
at the earliest in the Qing, right? So we have this Ming Dynasty gazetteer. And if you look over to the left and you see the big Buddha head there, to the right of it, you'll see the exposed um, Guanyin. So, of course, wood is clearly not the main material at Baodingshan. It is carved from the living rock. Uh, the stone at Baodingshan is relatively strong limestone, uh, but it's not as strong as like the granite you see at Fei Lai Fong, and it's not as soft as the sandstone at Dunhuang. Um, you get some, some nice definition, but there are other areas where um, adding to it was necessary. Um, if you want to get that three-dimensional quality, that's kind of part and parcel of a site like Baodingshan. Um, and you can see that evidenced here in the ox herding tableau. So if you've got your location, you've got your materials, then you look at the components, basic overview of the components of the site. Um, Baodingshan has three basic areas. Um, <laughs> it's complex because it has these distinctly different areas, but at the same time, those areas sort of interact with each other, right? Um, Great Buddha Bend, number one, um, Little Buddha Bend, number four, and the Sagacious Longevity Temple, number seven, are sort of the big areas of the site. Um, Great Buddha Bend is the site, part of the site that I think most people know and gravitate towards um, for obvious reasons. Um, Shaofawa and Little Buddha Bend, um, less so, and for a while there it was kind of restricted in terms of access, but has some similar and also some different imagery, um, also most likely a different audience. And then you have Shangshou Si um, and its accompanying pagoda. These are sort of the standard visual components of almost all sacred sites in China. All right. So if you move into then what else is at the site? You've got um, the text and image interplay, which I think is what you all are, are really interested in here. Um, we have to think about what are the primary textual sources. So to my mind, these include only those texts that we can logically assume were integral to the construction of the site, given their incorporation visually into the various tableaus. Those, and then the secular inscriptions, of which there are very few, dated to the Song Dynasty construction of the site. So I, you can see the various chunks of text here. You can also think about primary image sources. Um, again, two types. You have the main icons. I select a few of them here uh, that are associated with textual sources being depicted. Um, the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, for which we have pretty standard iconography set through textual sources. And then there are um, the innumerable secondary images. Uh, and I, I think these are the ones that make Baodingshan such a crowd pleaser. The iconography is left open by a lack of clarity within the religious texts, and that allows for more um, artistic play. So when you take all of these factors into account for any site, you basically have a snapshot of what that site looked like at the time it was created. So you also have a number of secondary sources that you can pull in when you're looking at a site and trying to figure it out. And again, I think uh, the turn to Anyue for, for looking at things now and the access to Anyue is going to help tremendously in understanding a lot of the different sites in Sichuan. Um, so secondary sources um, can be contemporaneous or earlier, such as those that you find um, at the neighboring site of Nanshan or more distant Anyue, although Anyue is still not that far away. Um, and these can take the form of similar imagery, like the hell scenes here, um, albeit smaller, similar to what we see at Baodingshan, and, or uh, texts. Again, the 1874 Datsu Gazetteer uh, talks about um, Datsu more broadly um, based on Sili and evidence found at Nanshan. So thinking a little bit more broadly about what you can find, and I think Wendy was talking about this uh, within the, the region to think about text and image interplay at a specific site is, is really kind of vital. Um, 
other secondary sources are not contemporaneous, but are useful in seeing how a site is received over time and how a site's usage has changed over time. And these are, of course, later inscriptions found at a site. Um, and those at Baudingshan make up the majority of the secular inscriptions. Historical sources, such as the Ming Dynasty gazetteers, as an example, or later gazetteers. Um, and you can also look at things like intrusive niches or, or things that are put in after the fact. Um, and I can talk a little bit more about these later in terms of reception. Um, so if you put all this together, you have your basic snapshot, which is just what's there, then you branch it out to your more panoramic view of an entire site and you start to build a corpus of material. So if we were thinking about consumption, um, the act of considering audience uh, is a foundational art historical approach, uh, and it's not really limited to those who come to see or consume a work, but also by its very nature to be a true consideration of audience, it has to engage with the intentions of those who created the works to be consumed. So in the case of Badingshan, the texts that are inscribed and the images that accompany them indicate a conscious choice on the part of the creator allowing us to infer what was deemed to be important vis-a-vis -vis the religious practice of the time, reflecting the concerns of the day. So these choices direct consumption in one way. And again, starting from an overarching view, one can begin to parse out why the texts and images are positioned the way they are within a particular site. Um, so Baudingshan is, is interesting because it appears to have no imperial connection, even though it was constructed on such a large scale. And so that, that fundamentally changes the rationale for the site. Um, there's no apparent need to placate uh, a noble class. And so the imagery and text can be fundamentally the choice of the creator. Uh, the other big difference for Baudingshan is there are no donor inscriptions. Um, and again, this greatly changes the text image dynamic of this site when you compare it to most other Chinese Buddhist cave sites of almost any size, where making sure that your name gets attached to what is being created in order so that you get that, that merit uh, is, is extremely important. And then the other thing to think about is, is again, tied to, to location. Um, it is so far removed from the main metropolitan areas that this also changes the dynamics. Again, sacred sites are created with specific ritual functions in mind. So the audience is key. So who is consuming this imagery and for what purpose? And we know so much about this site and its location and the degree of difficulty in getting there, um, at least historically, it is clearly um, a regional audience that's being served, at least um, maybe a few people from further field make it there, but very few. So the needs of the regional audience um, alongside that of that local monastic community are those that are being met at the site. So I make the argument that the monastic community is the main user of Shafawan, the the little Buddha bend and on top of the hill. And they may use, most likely use several components in Dafawan for their own ritual purposes and edification. Um, and once you pull those things out of what's happening at Baudingshan, it becomes easier to organize what is happening in Dafawan. So in my book, after thinking about this for 20 years, I outline a time-based approach to using the site based on the seasons, the Buddhist calendar, and a person's life cycle. And this has to do with um, not only Buddhist ritual practice, but also the evidence that is there in terms of later inscriptions. So when you do that, and you start to, you can pair up the components of the site, it starts to sort of fall into, into place. Um, I had started in 1992 with the Hell Tableau. And I soon realized that it was connected not only scripturally, but also very physically to the neighboring Pure Land Tableau, which was not only nearby, but also literally up above the hells, right? So the stairs to the left there take you down to the hells. Um, 
likewise, pairing uh, the Fumu Anjunjing, the description of the kindness of parents, with the Da Fang Bian Fu Bao and Jing, the Buddha's skillful means for the repayment of kindness, also made sense. Um, these two are complementary, sort of a call and response approach to these. Um, the grouping around the Pari Nirvana, including the birth of the Buddha, the bathing of the Buddha, the Buddha's assembly made sense in order to tell the Buddha's life story. And then, of course, the Thousand Arm Guan Yin uh, up against the Peacock Queen um, also made sense. These are two protector deities, two very um, important deities, particularly the Peacock Queen in Sichuan. So having them both there sort of facing off um, across the, the Parinirvana end of Great Buddha Ben makes sense. And lastly, um, the ox herding tableau and its approach to enlightenment facing the Master Leo tableau and his own approach to enlightenment also made sense. If I, if I was going to design Baoding Shan, I guess I would have come up with something like this. Um, the scattered imagery of Vairochana, I will admit, is harder to explain, uh, but it's well within the overarching context of Baoding Shan as a site inclusive of a wide range of Buddhist schools and practices and could be re read either as esoteric or as Vairochana as a protector deity or as the cosmic Buddha. There are lots of different ways to envision this. So once you have your bigger relationships between the various components of any site set out and recognized, moving in to consider the internal organization of a singular tableau becomes much more possible. And I apologize, it's really hard to get all of the north side of Great Buddha Bend on one screen. So this is kind of a wrap around, starting at the top right down to the bottom left. Um, so related to Buddhist rituals concerning filial piety, the afterlife of the deceased and the life of the Buddha, the choice of texts themselves are often seen at Baoding Shan to reflect a more populist audience. So prior to my work, Little had been made on the combination of text and image at the site. Um, precedence was largely given to the images as being explained by the text, um, subservient to the texts uh, in so many ways. And it was regularly argued that the images were there to instruct the illiterate with the accompanying text carved to serve as sort of a supplement. Um, and I guess if all of you have read my work, you know that basically, um, once you start looking at the inscribed text in conjunction with the images, it becomes apparent that the vast majority of images at the site are not that readily understood without the text. Or that they could have gotten a meaning, but it, it would be a pretty superficial understanding, right? So choosing to focus on the imagery alone means you effectively decouple them from the accompanying inscribed texts. And that sometimes leads to misinterpretations of actual meaning and function. So you gotta be cautious about doing that. Um, there's also a difference between how literate and illiterate um, worshipers would have engaged with the works. So the combination of texts and images within the narrative tableau provide the educated literati with a complementary interaction between the text and image. So in these works, the image does not simply illustrate the text, nor does the text explain the image. It can be argued that they produce a very different effect upon a literate viewer who is no longer simply worshiping an iconic image, but is actually kind of having a dialogue and participating in these large narrative tableau. Um, again, this would be a very different experience for a literate viewer. Um, and I know this just having worked there and being able to read the inscriptions, being around people who couldn't read them. Um, it's a very different experience, as we all know, than someone who is illiterate, right? So I'm going to give you a couple of examples from the narrative tableau at Baoding Shan, and this will show you how um, these texts and images would work for a literate viewer. So here we are at the Sutra on the Kindness of Parents tableau. Um, and the first level that we're gonna see is depicting, I'm gonna take you to 
one of the kindnesses. And this is the eighth kindness. Um, the inscribed text reads as follows. Uh, the verse of an ancient worthy says, once the child that one is raising finally grows up, it is natural to marry him off. At the wedding banquet, many animals are slaughtered, yet to whom will this evil karma redound? So in this work, the text describes to some degree the imagery is visually represented to the worshiper, carved on the front of the, the banquet table there. Um, behind it sits the son with his father and his future father-in-law. And the text speaks of marriage and the necessary feast for the animals have to be slaughtered. You have to have something tasty for, for the banquet. And then to the right, you see the mother with the butcher and he's got his club in his hand. He has just slaughtered the pig and the pig's head is resting there down be below them next to the pot for the cooking. So clearly the butcher has just completed the evil deed. And by cooking the ceremonial feast, the mother is dooming herself to evil karma as noted in the inscription. So if you're literate, you get all this. If you're not literate, you're basically seeing some people at a table and someone getting ready to cook a pig. What is even more interesting is if you can then follow the trail to um, where that evil kar karma is going to get you. And the evil karma is going to be paid for in the nearby hell of the iron wheel, um, where the inscription reads, the Buddha says, if one eats food or if one prepares food and serves it to parents, teachers, elders, friends, wife, children, and family, then in future lives, they will fall into the iron wheel hell. So in this way, the worshiper who's literate interacts with the text and image um, by necessity, if you comprehend the text in order to understand the image, you will get the greater implications here. Uh, if you don't, you don't necessarily make those connections. So the inscriptions in the Fumu Anjanjing are quite short. Um, unlike other tableau at Baodingshan, um, and I would say all of the other five narrative tableau at Baodingshan, considerably more information is presented in the inscribed text than could possibly be depicted. Uh, the scripture on the repayment of kindness tableau presents numerous examples of um, the second level of text working in conjunction with the surrounding imagery and the requisite greater interaction on the part of the viewer to fully understand a work's meaning. So I'll give an example here. So here you have the story uh, told in the inscription about the death of uh, the Buddha, Buddha's father. So here's the Buddha at his dying father's bedside. And the inscribed text, ooh, and it's a little fuzzy, I apologize, is this is the translation of the entire text, um, which I'm sure many of you know the, the story of this, the Buddha. But the underlying portion of the text, when the king heard this, the happiness he himself could not bear. So with his hand, he grasped the Buddha's hand and touched it to his heart. Whereupon as the king lay, he joined his palms together in reverence and his life ended his last breath cut off. That is what is actually depicted in the accompanying carving, the final moments of the life of Shakyamuni's father, whose last breath is signaled by the lotus leaf curling open, emanating skyward from his chest. So clearly the literate viewer would have more quickly grasped the meaning of this story than the illiterate viewer who would have required the intercession of a monk. Otherwise it just looks like the Buddha at someone's bedside, et cetera. So the textual portions inscribed in these two examples, two of many found at the site, point to the conscious depiction of the highlight of the story as viewed by the site's creator. Um, the text here, once again, clearly tells the viewer much more than the carved images. And since none of the inscribed texts themselves are given in their entirety, Zhao Zhifeng, the purported creator of uh, Baoding Shan, he had already edited out what he perceived were the less important portions of these works. 
So the function of the imagery could be viewed as, in this case, subservient to the text, because it serves as sort of this um, editorial interpolation by Zhao, who's emphasizing for the viewer what he feels was the text central message. Other people might have picked a different moment to, to, to carve, um, but that's the moment that he wanted. So a literate viewer would interact with the imagery in a fashion quite different from that of a an illiterate viewer, obviously being able to move beyond the less than obvious imagery to full comprehension of the sacrifices of the historical Buddha and of mothers for their sons. So again, this is one way to think about the interplay between text and image at a site. Another way to think about text and image at sites, and there are lots of different ways to do it, um, would be to think about text as image. So another level of reading the text and images at Baoding Shan takes into consideration not the content of the text so much as the quantity of text found carved in stone at the site. And there are lots of sites that have a lot of text, so you can start to think of this for other sites. Um, so the number of scriptural texts inscribed at Baoding Shan is, is exceptional. Um, and it's more unusual in that the placement of the text is put in conjunction with carved images. At other sites where you have a lot of sutra carving, they don't usually incorporate it as much with visual material directly alongside this, the text. So Baoding Shan is an exception. Um, at Baoding Shan, the artistic quality of the inscribed text is not the issue. Uh, no one calligrapher is credited. There's no um, emphasis on the aesthetics of the individual characters. The texts are inscribed in very readable kaishu, the standard script. Um, and again, that's by design. Um, however, I will note that um, they're not all that easy to read because as you may notice, some of them are quite high up. Um, so again, bear in mind that even though they're all there and we can read them in the 21st century because we have zoom lenses on our cameras and, and whatnot, um, in, the, in the day, I'm not sure everyone could read all of the text and that feeds into the idea of text as image at Baoding Shan. So if you think about text as image and you think about this anywhere you're at, um, the aesthetics of the inscribed scriptures holistically, if you start to think of blocks of text forming images within any tableau, it, it cha will change the way that the texts appear to you or that maybe they were envisioned by original worshipers. So given that textual imagery was part of the original plan for the grotto, the engraved scriptures at Great Buddha Ben need to be viewed as equals to the carvings that surround them. So if you consider them in this fashion, the inscribed texts become sacred objects unto themselves, not merely textual clarification for the more obvious icons. And again, we know that within um, Buddhist texts, Buddhist scriptures, the reader was often in effect told that the scriptural texts are metaphysical relics, that they're more worthy of offerings and reverence than actual physical relics of the Buddha, that um, the truth that the texts propound in the ritual training, the outline is the source from which all Buddhas come. So in order to envision what this would look like um, if you were to equate scriptural text with the Buddha himself, um, I went through, and I, this exists elsewhere, and replaced each textual portion of the six narrative tableau at Baoding Shan with the standard icon iconic image of a Buddha in a circle, which is a common motif at Baoding Shan. Um, and, and just everywhere where there's a block of text, I put in a Buddha. So the visual impression you get if you start to view text as image, if you start to view text as the Buddha's word, um, it's, it's really quite striking. 
um, symmetrically arranged throughout the whole, this is the north side of Baringshan, the figure of the Buddha as text now dominates each tableau. Again, they, the arrangement, the placement, the inscribed scriptures and the captions, everything is going to demand the viewer's attention. You cannot ignore them. Even if you can't read them, the power of the textual presence contri contributes to this visual patterning or rhythm within each of the carved tableau. So if you conceive of any site where there is text and image is uh, of them being equals, um, that interplay of text and image um, will show that imagery no longer dominates text and text is not subservient to, dim to image or vice versa. They are in essence one and the same to a worshiper. So if we move on lastly to reception, uh, it's important to think about the fact that the choice of the site's creator, um, there's direct consumption in one way, but as we are all aware, the creator's intention is not necessarily how a work is received. Um, at Baodingshan, there's about 101 later secular inscriptions that date from the Ming through the Republican era. And then there's even some more that go beyond that. Um, and they add a whole nother layer of meaning to the texts and images at this site. Um, again, it's interesting to note that they are mainly clustered in two areas of the site. Um, the one that you're looking at here, and I, and I direct you to the far left where the smoke is in that image, um, that's bowing. Um, that's the far western end of the site that around the corner where a bunch of uh, inscriptions exist. Um, the other place that has a number of secular inscriptions is next is as you go around the corner from there to the first um, carved image, which is the Vairochana um, bust also has numerous carved inscriptions around it. And then if I were to take you over to uh, the other side by Liu Bansun, the other Western end on the North side, you would see more inscriptions. And then if I were to take you down towards the river, you would encounter even more um, inscriptions. And these are all later inscriptions. And, and again, so this also um, feeds back to the original design and, and creation of the site and the, the notion of not having donor inscriptions being a part of the site because really there are very few places to even put them at the site. Um, all of it being sort of jam packed full of some really um, extraordinary imagery and text. So again, we can understand a, a lot about uh, the later usage of the site and what the site can tell us by translations of all these inscriptions and feel free to, I, at the end of this, I will share my, my website that has all of these translated and perhaps you can parse out other things that, that I haven't noticed. But again, this is where you start to see who's coming to the site. You start to see how they are viewing the site and you, you start to see um, the activity at the site. Um, some translations uh, of works paint uh, very vivid images for us. Um, one of those is uh, the 1818 Jiangshu text that was copied and inscribed by a later prefect at to Baodingshan. And Jiangshu does a really good job of taking us around the site and, and giving us um, what the site looked like in 1818. Um, and again, it's amazing because you can read it and it's it's very much the way it is still today. Hopefully I haven't been to Baudingshan in, in a few years now, thanks to the 
pandemic. Um, but you can you can see what was important, uh, and I think I, I note this in one of my things that I've written on Bodingshan that what he found important was not what we are so fascinated by. Um, I mean, the entire north side <laughs> is outlined here in a few lines of a you know a multi-line uh, work. So it's it's really fascinating as we as scholars we're fascinated by the the text and image uh, interplay. Um, he is not. He's not as fascinated by that. Um, so lastly, I think it's also important to uh, think about audience and site interactions. Uh, and basically, time makes for a really interesting way of, of thinking about this because all sites are evolving they're living entities and they're they're changing across time um so in concluding i, I put up this uh this last image which is the the image from the hell scenes which was the first one of the first images i saw of bouting in 1992 um which prompted me to go down this path uh for so many years uh and along with Jiangshu, I have to say, I, I remain in awe of Baodingshan. It, it, uh, it is one of those uh, sites that you know sticks with you. It's an extraordinary site. It has so many levels, so much to work on. When, when I first started working on the hell scenes, um, Professor Dr. Kyoko Tokuno, some of you may know her, was my advisor. And she, um, she said to me, she said, you're going to work on this for the rest of your life. And I laughed in 1992. I said, oh, no, no, I'm not going to work on this for the rest of my life. But here we are. <laughs> um, again, I'm going to end here and ask if anyone has any questions. I'm happy to go down any path with Bounding Shan. I, I feel like I've spent a lot of time with it. I'll put my uh, website in the chat. And you're also welcome to email me directly if you have questions.